Of all the technological advances of the 19th century, few captured the imagination like the railway locomotive. These steam-powered puffing devils heralded a new era of transportation, where people could travel quickly and comfortably to previously unimagined destinations, and goods could be delivered in much greater quantities for increased profit. Writer John Ruskin observed the rapid pace of change taking place in his native Britain. Along the iron veins that traverse the frame of our country beat and flow the fiery pulses of its exertion, hotter and faster every hour. But not everyone was enamoured of the train's grip on the 19th century imagination. That devilish iron horse whose ear-rending neigh is heard throughout the town has muddied the boiling spring with his foot, and he it is that has browsed off all the woods on Walden shore that Trojan horse with a thousand men in his belly, introduced by mercenary Greeks. Where is the country's champion, the Moor of Moor Hall, to meet him at the deep cut and thrust an avenging lance between the ribs of the bloated pest? demanded naturalist Henry Thoreau. Nevertheless, the locomotive was here to stay, and rail lines sprawled across continents, in 1830, there were only about 75 miles of railroad track in the United States. Within 10 years, that figure had exploded to almost 2,800 miles. With names like John Bull, Old Ironsides, and General Haupt, locomotives chugged across the American continent opening the West, encouraging migration, and showing people a world beyond their town or city. At first, America imported British engines, but the nation soon established its own thriving locomotive industry. By 1880, it was producing more than a thousand trains a year. Developed as a prototype in 1830, Tom Thumb was the first American-built steam locomotive used on a common carrier railroad, its vertical boiler included boiler tubes made from rifle barrels. Colonial powers consolidated their control by building railway lines that could transport soldiers and guns across continents. Germany stretched a rail link from Berlin to Baghdad, a politically explosive project that benefited the Ottoman Empire at the expense of the British and French. The British, in turn, set up railway companies in India and Africa to link the far-flung regions of its empire into rail networks. The most remote and exotic parts of the globe became accessible. Journalist Edwin Arnold said in 1865, railways may do for India what dynasties have never done. They may make India a nation. The Lahore railway station was a symbol of this optimism. Costing half a million rupees to build, its foundation stone was laid in 1859, and it still stands today. Built in the years immediately following the Indian Mutiny, the structure was designed to function both as a railway station and a fort. Russia, another great empire, also linked its principalities to a railway system. In 1891, it began construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway, a major arterial line designed to connect feeder lines across the Caucasus and Central Asia. The project cost almost one and a half billion rubles, and workers at both ends started construction at the same time, working in tandem towards the middle. In 1914, around the same time the Trans-Siberian was finished, Californians celebrated the opening of the Northwest Pacific Railroad. The line was a joint venture between Southern Pacific Railroad and Santa Fe Railroad, so the companies could share in the lucrative revenues flowing from a connection to the Redwood Lumber Mills around Humboldt Bay. Construction workers laid sleepers through some of the most rugged Pacific Northwest countryside, blasting tunnels through mountain ranges and building railway bridges over foaming gorges. A huge crowd gathered to welcome the first train passing through the towns of Willets, 
Cane Rock and Eureka in October 1914. But the railway had already suffered early problems. A number of dignitaries were stranded when a landslide blocked the line to Eureka. But for the townsfolk celebrating their new railway line, the Northwestern Pacific meant jobs, connection to civilization, and the prospect of a bright future. The railroad was christened with California wine wrapped in an American flag. It was a moment of patriotic pride and great optimism. And the moment was captured on film to be preserved for posterity. The same year, the Redwood Empire Special was christened at a special ceremony in Sacramento. Popular California governor, Sonny Jim Rolfe, engineered the start. The governor was a wealthy businessman who was adored by Californians for his down-to-earth manner and reputation for getting the job done. On the railways, the job was getting giant steam trains onto the tracks, trains that could transport huge shipments of lumber. The Redwood Empire Special hauled 117 cars bearing 3 million feet of California redwood to be delivered to 21 states. Giant Southern Pacific engines hauled their cargo over the Sierra, the longest and heaviest train ever taken over the hill in one block. Robbery, murder and mayhem on trains were popular plot devices for the authors of Penny Dreadfuls. In 1903, Edwin S. Porter made the first narrative film, a 10-minute one-reeler titled The Great Train Robbery. It was based on a true-life event in 1900, when outlaw Butch Cassidy and his gang blew up the safe in a mail train, escaping with $5,000 in cash. The leader of the Hole in the Wall gang, also known as the Wild Bunch, Butch Cassidy was a notorious train robber, targeting Union Pacific locomotives across the Wild West. His final raid netted more than $60,000 in cash. On August the 8th, 1963, Britain's most famous train robbery took place on the Royal Mail train, the Glasgow to London travelling post office. The operation to steal millions of pounds in used, unmarked bills was planned with precision and carried out with unparalleled daring. The thieves targeted the second carriage from the front, where valuables, mostly cash, were stored. Usually, the train only carried about £300,000, but because it had been a bank holiday weekend in Scotland, the coffers had swelled to about £2.3 million. The overnight train left Glasgow on Wednesday night. At three the next morning, driver Jack Mills had just passed Leighton Buzzard when he saw a red light signalling for stop at Sears Crossing. The train came to a halt. What Mills didn't realize was that the signal had been rigged by stuffing a glove over the green light and attaching a six-volt battery to the red. Co-driver David Whitby got out of the train to see what the problem was. He discovered the railway communications cable had been cut. Before he could get back into the train, he was attacked, handcuffed and thrown down the embankment. In view of the robbery, British Railway's rule book was later amended to prohibit drivers from leaving the cab when they encountered a red light. Meanwhile, one of the robbers entered the cabin and knocked Jack Mills unconscious. Although no one was seriously hurt, the experience shook the victims badly, especially Jack Mills, who never worked again. A very long year to you, Mr Mills. Yes, sir. How do you feel now, yourself? Oh, How are you feeling? I feel all right in my soul. Yes. But, uh, can get rid of complications in my right arm. Yes. 
You're going back, you're, you are back at driving, aren't you, here? Well, it's uh, preparing, oiling. And, yes. Uh, now, how's it going? Oh, not too bad. Uh, you think you'll be back driving again soon? No, I, don't, I don't think so. Do you feel any bitterness against the people who attacked you? Well, I don't know. All those were too long? <laughs> it's a long time, isn't it? Yes. Uh, the, I think it'll uh, make anybody uh, think they're going to do it again. They'll think twice. It didn't take long for police to track down the thieves' hideout, and the gang was soon on the run. In 1964, 13 men were sent to jail for a total of 307 years for carrying out Britain's notorious Great Train robbery. But just four months later, Charlie Wilson broke out in an escape as daring as the robbery itself. A gang of men on the outside stole the builder's ladder to scale the walls of the mental hospital that lay next to the prison and freed Wilson and three other prisoners from their cells using a master key. Mrs. Williams, will you tell us what happened at five minutes past three? Well, I was doing my housework when I... I did notice a green zephyr go up the road, took no notice. Then a red van went up. I thought, oh, someone's moving. Then I heard an engine running. So I rushed out and got my handbag, thinking it was the baker to get a loaf. I get to the door and I see the red van is back and back onto uh, backing and the Zephyr following it. So I uh, stand there and I don't realize, and I think the man's got a silk scarf over his head tied on top, looked like a coconut. And I thought, oh gosh, it's a, it's a, oh, it's a spring. It's, they're gonna get someone out. And, um, then they get a sort of platform on top of the uh, van and something went over the wall, which obviously is a, um, a ladder. The man was quite um, a stockily built man with blue overalls on, as I say, this silk stocking over his head. And you knew then it was going to be a, a Oh, spring. as soon as I see the masks. Then I look further along at the Zephyr and the man there has come out and he's got a... Um, silk stocking on with a scarf halfway on, round his face there and a peak cap and um, I notice he's got a, 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 a rifle so I think this is where I go in I go indoors and shut the door very quickly bolt it I don't know anything what am I going to do because there's nothing I can do to help them so and then I, what happened I, so after a while, when I sort of calmed down, I went and had a look out my bedroom window and I see two prisoners come over the wall. I only saw two. I must be Pacific on that. How, I did how were they dressed, two. Mrs Williams? Oh, in their in, um, blue overalls and striped shirts. A huge manhunt was launched to find the fugitives, but it took police three years to track Wilson down to his hiding place in Canada. Great train robber Ronnie Biggs was similarly disinclined to serve out his sentence and plotted an escape that was to prove more successful than Wilson's. He escaped to Paris, Australia, and then to Brazil. Biggs forged a new life in Rio, becoming a tourist attraction for Britons. In 1999, he invited more than 100 people to celebrate his 70th birthday in style. But Biggs's health was fading fast after a series of strokes and in 2001, he returned to Britain, where he was sent back to jail to serve the remainder of his sentence. British trains continued to be a popular target for thieves. On the 15th of April 1983, several men secretly entered the mail van attached to the Euston to Manchester train before it left London. During the trip, they emptied 60 registered mailbags and transferred valuables into rucksacks. Police discovered that the thieves escaped as the train approached Crewe Station, halfway between London and Manchester. The gang threw as many bags as they could out onto the track before the train reached the platform. They were then met by accomplices and hurried to a waiting van. The robbery was discovered when the train stopped at the station. It was a highly organised raid. In 1990, a masked gang held up a mail train at Gormanston Station in Dublin. The men were thought to be Irish paramilitaries and escaped with 80 mailbags. The robbery had been meticulously planned. The men wore combat jackets and spoke with Northern Ireland accents. Detectives say hallmarks of a paramilitary operation. 
but no one knows exactly how much money they got away with. A nearby house was damaged during the heist when gunmen forced their way in and took a woman hostage, but she was later released unharmed. The front doorbell rang and I went to answer it and a man with a, with a gun pointed a gun at me and forced his way into the hall past me. What did he say? He said, just do what we tell you and you won't be harmed. Authorities believe the robbery was carried out by an Irish Republican paramilitary group to raise funds for its activities opposing British rule in Ireland. Three years later came the greatest train robbery since 1963. An armed gang forced open padlocked gates at the side of London's Euston station. They forced rail employees to open the carriages, beating two postal workers with a handgun. From the little that I am aware of at the moment, I think they've, uh, they've been through a harrowing experience, uh, and one certainly I don't think any of us would like to go through. Large quantities of cash are rarely transported by rail today, but the Euston Hall netted postal orders and road tax discs worth several million pounds. Obviously, the, the thing about the use of a, a post office uniform uh, presupposes that it's fairly well planned. Within just 12 minutes, the gang had escaped in a blue Ford Transit van, disappearing into the bustle of nighttime traffic. The robbery led to an investigation into why the high value mailbags were not under the protection of police. The dramatic potential of train travel was quickly evident to authors and playwrights. Plays about brave girls rescuing locomotives in peril gave way to films that used real trains as props. In episode 26 of The Hazards of Helen, Wild Engine, filmed in 1915, a plucky telegraph operator single-handedly stops a runaway engine from plowing into a passenger train. Bee's Buzz was a Mac Senate comedy from 1929 and one of Hollywood's early talkies. A train sequence is used for both comic and dramatic effect, with the train whistle heightening the tension as a couple stranded on railroad tracks panic over the approaching train. It was a setup that was to be repeated in countless movies over the years. Great director of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, used trains in many ways in some of his greatest films. In Strangers on a Train, it's the venue for a murderous proposition. It starts with the shriek of a train whistle and ends with shrieking excitement, trumpeted one of the promotional posters. In North by Northwest, a luxurious sleeper is a place for Cary Grant to both hide out and meet his love interest, Eva Marie Saint. A train may be an old-fashioned way to travel, but an upper berth can be a lovely way to go when it's your time to go, said a poster. These days, trains are used as glamorous venues to promote blockbuster films. In 2006, stars Tom Hanks and Audrey Tattoo joined director Ron Howard to celebrate the release of The Da Vinci Code, one of that year's most anticipated films. They arrived on a high-speed Eurostar train at London's Waterloo Station, breaking the record for the longest non-stop international rail trip along the way. In the Netherlands, it's not just movie stars who can enjoy a cinematic experience on wheels. To celebrate 25 years of the annual Dutch Film Festival, Dutch Railways converted a train carriage into a big screen cinema. Anyone with a valid train ticket could watch the Autumn Cinema. It presented new releases, together with a range of short films suitable for those traveling shorter distances. But you had to be quick. The season ran for just five days during the 2005 Dutch Film Festival. And when your film's called The Train, it makes perfect sense to travel to the world premiere via rail. 
Actor Emran Hashi and his co-stars boarded a specially commissioned train on a trip to Yorkshire to launch the Bollywood thriller. It's a great platform to uh, promote uh, my film to, the, to an overseas audience. Uh, these are my first, principally my first uh, overseas release. Uh, one is Train and uh, subsequently at the end of the month there's another film releasing Awarapan which will be premiering and uh, releasing worldwide. So it's great that uh, you've got a platform where uh, the entire industry, the film industry, is coming to Yorkshire and there's a huge population that's going to see the films. So it's, I'm very excited about it. Yorkshire, here we come. Hey, Yorkshire, here we come. The train stars enjoyed a luxurious trip to Yorkshire where they presented the premiere of their film to open the Indian Film Academy Awards at Cineworld Castleford in Bradford. The Shinkansen, a sleek, futuristic speeding bullet that symbolizes the Japanese love of modernity and efficiency. It runs on rail lengths a mile long, on which it has reached 150 miles an hour on a trial run. Even then, it wasn't flat out. On regular runs between Tokyo and Osaka, nearly 500 miles, the bullet will keep the speed needle steady at 190 kilometers, about 120 miles an hour. Even with five stops, it cuts the journey time to four hours. With their sense of timing, the Japs will have a small fleet of these thousand passenger trains when all the world's in Tokyo for the Olympic Games. Shinzi Sogo, president of Japan National Railways, which operates the trains, was present for a speed trial in the 1960s that saw the Shinkansen reach a record-breaking 256 kilometers an hour. The diesel engine streamliner passed all its tests with flying colors. The Bullet was the first standard gauge train built in Japan. It was developed as a response to the pressures modern life had brought to Japan a burgeoning population that was concentrated in the big cities and relatively close distances. At the time, the bullet train was the most modern form of transport in the world. It set new standards for efficiency and comfort, and formed the prototype for high-speed rail across the globe. The Tokyo to Osaka rail line was constructed in only five and a half years. The 320-mile track cost a staggering $640 million to build, but was making a profit within 18 months of opening. In 1967, the Tokyo to Osaka rail link carried an average 100,000 passengers a day during the 60 round trips it made between the two cities. speeds reaching 195 kilometers an hour, safety is of primary concern. The precautions seem to be working. In the 40 years of their operation, Shinkansen have never had a major accident. The Europeans were particularly interested in the technology and went on to build successful fast train links, notably the TGV in France and the Eurostar, which travels between France and England via the Channel Tunnel. Japanese bullet trains are famous for their punctuality and have moved from diesel to electric energy. But even in the 1960s, scientists were investigating revolutionary power options, including jet power. In 1969, Professor Kiyonojo Ozawa tested a prototype rocket-propelled bullet train model. It reached a reported 1,200 kilometers an hour during the test run. While jet-powered trains have yet to become a reality, in 1992, Central Japanese Railway unveiled its latest acquisition, a state-of-the-art bullet train called the Nozomi. The name is Japanese for hope, and a thousand passengers excitedly boarded the train at the ancient capital of Kyoto for its inaugural journey. The Nozomi can reach 300 kilometers an hour, 
its speed restricted only by the old tracks on which it travels. The year after the Nozomi went into service, train fares were cut by 10% and scheduled services doubled in an effort to win back patronage from the airlines. The move proved to be a popular one as passengers appreciated the convenience of travelling to stations located in the centre of town rather than airports on the outskirts. It's faster to take the train from Tokyo to Osaka than it is to fly. Another area where Japanese technology is leading the way is train ticketing. Some Japanese commuters are now using their mobile phones to pay their way through the ticket barriers. More than 740,000 passengers walk through the ticket gates at Shinjuku Station every day. But Japan's biggest train company, East Japan Railway, have introduced some new technology which will make buying tickets easier. The Mobile Suica system allows passengers with chip-equipped mobile phones to pass through the barriers with ease. Thousands of shops in Japan are already equipped with the Suica technology. Just touch your phone to the reader and the transaction is done. The popularity of the mobile phone has transformed a once luxury item into the world's must-have accessory. This latest innovation is sure to make the mobile an even more essential tool in many people's lives. As well as luxury and romance, train travel has led to some tragic accidents. In 1943, there was devastation when a train derailed in Nuremberg in Germany. Railways were at capacity during war operations, leading to a number of fatal accidents. Seven persons were injured when a passenger train plowed into a derailed locomotive near Lancaster, Pennsylvania during a blinding snowstorm. The crash occurred before tracks could be cleared following an earlier derailment. Winter adds its hazards to America's war-burdened railroads. The following year, disaster struck Britain's railways near Durham. Another post-war disaster strikes Britain's railways. The fast London Newcastle Express crashed into a freight train with a cost of 10 lives and many injured. Sleeping coaches are splintered and piled 20 feet high. The death toll was considered miraculously low, considering that the crowded train carried 400 passengers. The wreck was the third to be visited on British railways within a seven-day period. Soldiers join wrecking crews in probing the tangled wreckage. England's fine safety record suffers a grievous blow. Frogman was sent into a freezing lake to search for crash victims following a train derailment in Sweden in 1958. The train left the track about 100 yards from Hultafors station and plunged into a nearby lake. For 48 hours, in sub-zero conditions, the frogman checked and double-checked the wrecked train for crash victims, but found nothing. The final casualty list stood at 20 passengers injured, an amazingly small figure in view of the damage sustained by the Gutenberg Boras Express. Swedish railway officials concluded that the accident was caused by a fault in the lines, possibly due to the intense cold prevalent at the time. The same year, a mountain train plunged into a valley in West Germany. The train started its downward journey from the 1,053-foot-high station towards Königswinter on the Rhine. Suddenly, one coach lurched and plunged from the track, smashing its way down the mountainside. Flowers, hurled from the train as it gathered speed on its death plunge, showed how the day started. The bodies, stretched out under the trees, told how it ended. In 1966, Chicago commuters got a fright when two carriages of Chicago's overhead railway system left the rails and plunged 10 meters onto the street below. One man was killed and at least 25 people were injured. The accident occurred during a rainstorm as the elevated train traveled above Indiana Avenue. 
it slipped off the rain-slicked tracks and crashed down on the street below. The accident stopped the morning rush hour traffic on the line and tens of thousands of commuters were trapped in trains elsewhere along the route. In the years since these rail accidents, tragedies still occur, but technology is working to make rail travel as safe as possible. The Hatfield rail disaster in 2000 killed four people and injured 102. Nearly two years earlier, engineers had identified a form of fatigue known as gauge corner cracking in the rail, which eventually broke and caused the crash. Since Hatfield, the pursuit of safety has become even more of a concern for rail and train operators. But checking thousands of miles of track for defects and wear and tear is a slow and costly process. However, soon every train, whether high-speed mainline or a local service, passenger or freight, could be carrying a device that continuously checks the rails for defects, no matter how fast the train is travelling. This technology is the brainchild of the University of Warwick's physics department. Dr. Steve Dixon and colleague Dr. Rachel Edwards have taken a pair of electromagnetic acoustic transducers which generate and detect ultrasound waves and found a way to propagate a wave along the track from which they can measure cracks and defects faster and more accurately than existing systems. A good analogy to use is that we have a piano we hit all the keys at once. There's lots of different frequencies there. We use a program called a Fourier transform to break that down and tell us what frequencies are present in the pulse. With the waves that we're looking at, lower frequency waves travel to deeper depths. So if we can break down the wave into these different frequency components, we have another means of saying how deep the, the defect is by looking at the proportion of the wave frequencies that can sneak underneath the defect compared to those that are blocked. We can combine that with just the amplitude measurement. So if you like, we have two ways of checking and giving us information of the depth of the defect. Gauge corner cracking, small fissures in the rail surface, which were the precursor to the Hatfield crash, are one of the problems detected by this method. To test its accuracy, the researchers have created cuts of measured depth into the rail surface. Then they generate an ultrasound pulse along the surface of the rail and record its behaviour on a computer. As the detector moves close to a defect, the surface wave reflected from the defect can interfere with the incident wave to give a larger amplitude signal. Firstly, the approach we're using here is non-contact. This means that it's much more practically viable to operate the system. There's no need to maintain good contact with liquid couplants. Because we're using a separate generator and detector, we don't run into the same physical limitations of the inspection speed of a conventional system, which may be limited to doing inspections online at around 30 miles an hour. If the scientists succeed, they can transform every British train into a highly sophisticated rail monitoring system that routinely examines the tracks for any potential defect, radically improving the safety and efficient management of the rail network. Russian and Chinese officials arrive at Moscow's railroad station to board the first Moscow Peiping Express, linking the capital... Great train journeys combine magnificent scenery with luxury travel. The Moscow to Peking Express gave citizens of the communist USSR a glimpse of the outside world. In 2007, the Golden Eagle was put back on the rails to give those who can afford it a taste of the high life. I am looking forward to travelling on the Golden Eagle so that I can experience for myself the pleasures of elite railway tourism. A single ticket on the luxury train will set you back a sweet 19,235 US dollars for the 13 to 15 day journey. A ticket on a normal Russian train costs around 400 US dollars for the seven day non stop trip. The Eagle runs on the Trans-Siberian Railway, travelling from Moscow through vast pine forests, over the Ural Mountains and across Siberian tundra to the Pacific Ocean. Operated by British firm GW Travel, 
the train will take double the time from Moscow to Vladivostok by stopping for excursions. Trans-Siberian rail traveller previously had to cope with random compartment companions, a restaurant menu that stretched from beetroot soup to dried fish, and no shower. These are not problems the Golden Eagle traveller will have to worry about. The grand arm of indulgent rail travel is the famous Orient Express. At its peak, steaming across pre-war Europe, the original Orient Express inspired more thrillers than any other train in the world. From Graham Greene to Agatha Christie, novelists told of its legendary high living and low deeds. It was the Orient that made the train so famous in the realms of fact and fiction. It ran across Europe from Paris to the Balkans and Turkey. But the Express was the setting for stories of intrigue, adventure and mystery. The fascination was that the films and novels owed something to real events. Bodies occasionally did fall from carriages, and each station promised romance for strangers who met on the train. As train travel declined in Europe during the post-war years, Orient Express services were dropped. Sadly, the train stopped running to Paris. Air travel and delays and restrictions at some East European frontiers were given as reasons for the Express ending. The first Orient Express pioneered the idea of crossing Europe by rail and eating and sleeping in comfort. The original Orient Express made its inaugural journey on October the 4th, 1883, transporting about 40 very important persons in style from Paris to Romania. The first six years were adventurous. Passengers had to navigate perilous open catwalks between cars. In the 1890s, travellers got off the Orient Express at the tiny Danube town of Georgiou and took ferry boats across the river to Rutchuk in Bulgaria. From there, a train took them to a Black Sea port where another boat took them to Constantinople. But by 1889, Paris and Constantinople were connected and it took 67 hours and 35 minutes to make the transcontinental journey. Soon, other versions of the Orient Express came into being but none captured the imagination like the original. The heyday of the Orient Express was at the turn of the century. Later, during the 1920s, tales of murder, mystery and espionage grew around it. An extension to the rail line was started in 1906 with the building of the Simplon Tunnel, which enabled the train to travel as far as Milan, Venice and Trieste. From Italy, it would then steam as far as Istanbul. In 1982, the Venice Simplon Orient Express was revamped to run twice weekly from Calais to Venice. The Pullman cars were refurbished and restored to original condition. In 1988, the service set a world record for the longest train journey ever made. The Express travelled from France to Hong Kong non-stop. But despite its popularity and mystique, many countries dropped the Orient Express from their schedules. However, the far-seeing Swiss cashed in by running a commemorative Orient Express from Zurich using original carriages. Platform entertainment reinforced the period atmosphere. This specially run train, which King Boris himself used to drive across his Balkan kingdom, preserves all the old comforts from the splendor of the sleeping berths to the pride of the service, the luxurious dining cars. On today's menu, a ham and melon starter, followed by roast beef and spinach, washed down by fresh Italian wines. Here, long ago, is where crown heads mixed with captains of industry and secret agents dallied with femme fatales. On this trip, anyone can be anyone. In 1993, the Orient Express went truly oriental when a luxury train service was established between Singapore and Bangkok. The Asian version of a train that had been synonymous with romance, mystery and opulence for more than 100 years in Europe is counting on snob appeal to keep it rolling. The Eastern and Oriental Express, billed as a luxury hotel on wheels, chugs its way for 41 hours through the rubber and oil palm plantations, jungles and villages of Malaysia and Thailand. The 
Each cabin, designed for two people, is carpeted and has a private bath with shower. The decor features parquetry and oriental floral motifs etched onto wooden panels and glass. Upholstered couches can be converted to beds. Two restaurant cars, a bar car fitted with a piano and an open-air observation deck at the train's tail end allow its passengers to ride the rails in style. It's an opportunity to see the, uh, the jungle or see the country from the, from the uh, land side. Flying back and forth always as I do, I never see anything. The food was terrific and um, just uh, everyone, the staff really, I think, really made the trip. They were so, um, so good and so helpful. In remote areas of South Africa, a train is being used to save lives and has become a symbol of cooperation between South Africa and France to help ease poverty. For 11 years, the Felofepa train, a word coming from the Tswana and Sutu languages meaning good, clean health, has been providing low-cost or free medical services to the country's poor. Most of its patients live in areas with no hospitals or clinics, in a country where a huge amount of skilled medical staff leaves for better paid jobs abroad. Sometimes patients walk for up to 30 kilometers in the early morning in order to get to the station in time to be treated. The trained staff, including about 40 university students who work as volunteers in two-week shifts, delivers its services for nine months a year, providing general health screenings, psychological counseling, dental care, optometry services, including the making of spectacles, and education programs for schools. I have heard about on a television that it's, it's free to come and see if something's wrong with you, your eyes and stuff like that. Since January 1994, when South African transport company Transnet founded it, only months before the country's first democratic elections, its staff has treated more than one million indigent people, but national donations are barely enough to keep it running. South African ambassador to France, Nomosanto Sibanda Tusi, said international funding was crucial for the survival of the project. Over in Eastern Europe, the government has employed trained staff of a different kind to cope with the growing problem, crowded carriages. Pushers have been hired to pack people into peak hour trains. Orange-clad attendants cram passengers into carriages and make sure the doors close properly so the trains can leave on schedule. All sorts of metro employees, from electricians and engineers to train shed workers, have taken their turn in the role. Metro executives say the pushers were necessary to help maintain train schedules as the underground gets busier. The need arose for these assistants because the flow of passengers rose dramatically. The gap between trains is one minute and 30 seconds. We can't reduce the gap any further, so we asked for help in ensuring the doors are closed so that the schedule of trains is not disrupted. But some people oppose the move, saying the government should have provided more train cars or built new metro lines to reduce the problem of overcrowding. Others say forcibly pushing people into the carriages slows the process and makes the problem worse. In South Korea, the Seoul Metropolitan Subway Corporation has introduced a more popular innovation on its subways, Christmas and New Year trains to celebrate the holiday season. South Korea is well known for adorning its trains during big events and festivals. We prepared this event to offer hope and dreams to people commuting in the dry and dreary atmosphere of a subway. The theme for this year is love and peace, and organizers wanted the decorations to create a happy, fairy tale like environment for commuters. 
During the train ride, Santas entertain children with carols, accordions, candy and presents. Children and parents love the activities and goodies on offer. The trains run five times a day during the holiday season. These days, most steam trains have been relegated to museums or special tourist railways, but not in Burma, where 20 steam-powered locomotives still keep the country's citizens moving. At the insane Myanmar locomotive shed, people are hard at work building and repairing the country's trains. The factory has been in existence for nearly 130 years and helped pave the way for the arrival of the locomotive in Myanmar. Many of the trains were imported to Myanmar from Britain after the end of the war. Today, the workers are building replacement parts for the country's network of old steam locomotives. Umang Fen, supervisor at the factory, says it's becoming increasingly difficult to find the coal needed to fuel the steam engines. As the Myanmar government looks for ways of improving its railway system and finding alternative energy sources, it could be that train lovers will lose one of the few remaining places in the world where steam engines are still in general use. Ordering the spare parts from outside is expensive. By producing the spare parts ourselves, we can reduce the expense. Those parts from outside are very expensive because of the technology involved. Before, we used coal with this kind of engine. But now we have difficulties in sourcing it, as there is a shortage of coal. So now we are trying to use an alternative fuel. Kenya is another place where steam trains have a long and glorious history. In 2001, Mount Gelai, one of the most powerful steam engines built for meter-gauge tracks, left Nairobi, Kenya's capital city, in full service for the first time in 13 years. It was among 34 locomotives that first went into service in Kenya in 1955. Fittingly, the 34 locos were named after the highest peaks in East Africa and became known as the Mountain Class. In the mid-1970s, the Mountain Class, by then pulling goods trains, began to be withdrawn. In the early 1990s, they were cut up for scrap. However, two survived. After the decision was made to put Mount Gelai back into service, it took three months of renovation work to bring her back into working order. Pensioners had to be called up from retirement to help with the work and run the locomotive. It's been a long journey for many of them. It was a proud moment for Kirpal Singh, who drove Mount Gelai for 17 years. That is the most beautiful part of it when the steam comes out and it gives you very good puff. Chuk, 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 chuk. No other engines can give you that sound. After three months of hard work renovating the prized relic, the Kenya Railways and train enthusiasts were proud to flag off engine number 5918, Mount Kelai. It's hoped that this locomotive can be used for a special safari steam service on the Mombasa Voy line. Built by colonialists, the line opened up the East African interior. The revival of the steam engine has aroused great interest among train enthusiasts worldwide. It's hoped that the steam engine will provide a necessary boost for Kenya's ailing tourism industry, which is plagued by poor infrastructure, security worries and competition from other African destinations. But it's going back in time, it's going back in our history and probably 
our children will never see this happening again, not for the first time again after such a long time. And I think everybody should be lining the route. Seeing the African countryside and wildlife from a classic train is an exciting prospect.